University Malaysia Kelantan UMK is an entrepreneurial university. We implement the government's aspiration to ensure the younger generations are not only highly educated but also entrepreneurial. UMK is the number one entrepreneurial university in Malaysia and aspires to be one of the world's best by 2030. This is in line with the National Entrepreneurship Policy which aims to make Malaysia an entrepreneurial country by 2030. According to this vision, UMK ensures the whole university functions within an entrepreneurial ecosystem. This ecosystem comprises 10 faculties supported by institutes and centres of excellence implemented with a discipline of innovation-based entrepreneurship. 
the university's upper management, together with UMK employees at all levels, are committed to realizing UMK as a Malaysia public university well respected for its foundation of entrepreneurship. Implementing this ecosystem, the UMK Entrepreneurship Institute UMKEI oversees three other entrepreneurship-based centers, the Center for Entrepreneurship Development and Education CEED, the Institute of Small and Medium Enterprises ISMI, and the Global Entrepreneurship Research and Innovation Center GERI. The Faculty of Entrepreneurship and Business, spearheading this structure, has successfully developed collaborative entrepreneurial networks such as UMK Frontier Street, Entrepreneurship Advisory Council, and proudly led the Committee for Mohe Guide to Entrepreneurship Integrated Education. From the academic aspect, UMK offers 31 undergraduate programs and 22 postgraduate programs in the fields of business and management, tourism and hospitality, science and technology, as well as arts and heritage. The university is constantly enhancing its teaching and learning system to ensure that the process of learning takes place creatively and innovatively through my academic integrated system, my eyes, massive open online courses, MOOCs, and blended learning. UMK is committed to the development of first-class graduates to become the leaders of the industry. Collaboration with world-class local corporate sectors, as well as a network of well-known regional educational institutions, is aimed at empowering UMK from various angles. This is evidenced by the increase in the marketability of graduates and graduates who create jobs through businesses. Research, innovation and commercialization is another important part of UMK. Research funding and the number of innovations and commercialized products increase every year. UMK has performed well in various prestigious competitions. With the hashtag UMK for Society, UMK is also involved in various community activities. Our staff and students consistently demonstrate outstanding skills and abilities. With such a great spirit of teamwork, UMK has never looked back to emerge as a respected educational entity in the region. We at UMK believe that our presence will give a new look to the development of the value of knowledge. Indeed, our core entrepreneurship will always make us University Malaysia Kelantan relevant, unique and different. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and a very good morning. The Honorable Professor Dr. Dr. Razli bin Cik Raza, Vice Chancellor, University of Malaysia Kelantan. The Honorable Dr. Abdul Kadir Abu Hashim, Director General Department of Wildlife and National Parks, Peninsula Malaysia, as the first keynote speaker of 5th International Conference on Tropical Resources and Sustainable Sciences. The Honorable Professor Technology Sir Dr. Pasupaleti Vijayaswara Rao, Director of International Relations and Research Collaborations, Riva University, India, as the second keynote speaker of the International Conference on Tropical Resources and Sustainable Resources. Invited speakers are Professor Dr. Bhagwan Singh Chaudhry from Kurukshetra University, India, Professor Dr. Insinyur Ahmad Eman Hamdani from Vistas Pajajaran, Indonesia. Associate Professor Dr. Roger T. Sarmiento from Caraga State University, Philippines. Professor Technologist Dr. Arham Abdullah, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Research and Innovation, University of Malaysia, Kelantan. Joe Specialist Dr. Wani Sofia Udin, Chairman of Fifth International Conference on Tropical Resources and Sustainable Sciences. Associate Professor Technologist Dr. Muhammad Faiz Muhammad Amin. Dean, Faculty of Earth Science, University, Malaysia, Kelantan. Citrus of 5.0 committee members, local and international presenters and participants. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to be an MC for Citrus 5.0. 5 
My name is Dr. Hafsan Eva Mansour from the Faculty of Earth Science, University of Malaysia, Kelantan. On behalf of the Citrus 5.0 Committee, we wish to extend our warm welcome, selamat datang, and thank all of you for taking time off to attend the virtual opening ceremony of the 5th International Conference on Tropical Resources and Sustainable Sciences 2023 Citrus 5.0 organized by Faculty of Earth Science, University, Malaysia, Kelantan. The organizing committee takes great pleasure in welcoming local and international researchers, including experts, scientists, academicians, researchers, and others from various disciplines to participate and explore the issue of natural resource management from the environmental, social, and economic perspective and solutions. The theme of this conference is sustaining life and natural resource wealth through responsible stewardship and covers five principal themes, biodiversity and conservation, sustainability and technology, geoscience, environmental, social and governance, and environmental economics. Citrus 5.0 has received an overwhelming response from distinguished researchers. We are thankful that the number of participants was in fact beyond our expectations. All the best submitted manuscripts will be published in BioWeb of Conference Index by Scopus. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we are pleased to invite your specialist, Dr. Wan Sofia Udin, Chairman of the 5th International Conference on Tropical Resources and Sustainable Sciences 2023, Citrus 5.0, to deliver her welcoming remarks. Please welcome Dr. Wan Sofia. Rahim, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good day. The Honorable Dr. Abdul Qadir Abdul Hashim, Director General, Department of Wildlife and Natural Parks, Peninsula Malaysia, our first keynote speaker of International Conference on Tropical Resources and Sustainable Sciences 5.0. Our second keynote speaker, Professor Technologist Dr. Pasupuleti Viswaswara Rao, Director, International Relations and Research Collaborations, Riva University, India. Invited speakers, Professor Baguan Singh Chandri from Kuruk Shetra University, India. Professor Ahmad Helman Hamdani from University of Pat Jajaran, Indonesia. Associate Professor Dr. Roger T. Sarmiento from Kerach State University, Philippines. Professor Datuk Dr. Razli Cik Razak, Vice Chancellor, University Malaysia Kelantan. Professor Technologist Dr. Arham Abdullah, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Research and Innovation. Associate Professor Technologist Dr. Muhammad Faiz Muhammad Amin, Dean, Faculty of Earth Science, University Malaysia Kelantan. Citrus 5.0 Committee Members, Local and International Presenters and Participants, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. It is my, my, it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you from abroad and within Malaysia to participate in the Citrus 5.0, the 2023 International Conference on Tropical Resources and Sustainable Sciences. I am proud to report that in this virtual Citrus 5.0, we have successfully managed to gather two well-distinguished keynote speakers, three invited international speakers from India, Indonesia, and Philippines, and 117 presenters from local and international. I hope all the participants, international as well as local participants, will optimize your participation in this conference and gain many benefits throughout these two consecutive days. May this conference stimulate the participants to expand collaborations through mutually beneficial research partnership. Once again, thank you for participating and delivering insightful sharing related to our today's theme, Sustaining Natural Resources Wealth Through Responsible Stewardship. On behalf of the organizing committees, apologies also for any shortcomings or unprecedented glitch on our virtual platform later on. We thank you for your patience and cooperation in advance. From the bottom of my heart, I take this opportunity to thank each and every one of Citrus 5.0 
organizing committee members for your excellent service throughout the couple of month preparation. With your vast experience or otherwise, you have indeed played your part in organizing this conference as expected. I would like also to take this opportunity to express my greatest appreciations to many parties involved in this conference, namely all authors and conference participants, papers reviewers and juries, keynotes and invited speakers, Faculty of Earth Science, University of Malaysia, Kelantan, local sponsors, and all other individuals and parties that are directly or indirectly involved in CTREF 5.0. I wish all of you the best in your research, your work, and your life. If an opportunity comes, we will host and invite you to join our conference in the near future. Inshallah. Till then, have a fruitful conference. Thank you. Wassalam. Thank you, just especially Sir Dr. Wani Sofia Udin. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, now I am honored to invite Professor Datuk Dr. Razli Benchik Raza, Vice Chancellor, University of Malaysia Kelantan, to deliver his speech and officiate the fifth International Conference on Tropical Resources and Sustainable Sciences 2023. Please welcome Professor Datuk Dr. Razli. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good day. The Honorable Dr. Abdul Qadir Abdul Hashim, Director General, Department of Life and National Parks, Peninsula Malaysia, as our first keynote speaker of the International Conference on Tropical Resources and Sustainable Sciences 5.0. Our second keynote speaker, Professor T.S. Dr. Pasupalati Veneswara Rao, Director International Relations and Research Collaboration, Reba University of India. Invited speakers, Professor Wagwang Singh Chaudhry from Kuru Shetra University of India. Professor Ahmad Helman Madani Hamdani from University of Pajajaran, Indonesia. I say Professor Dr. Roger T. Saminto Karaga, State University, Philippines. Professor T.S. Dr. Arhamdullah, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Research and Innovation, UC Malaysia, Kelantan. G.S. Dr. Wani Sofia Udin, Chairman of International Conference on Tropical Resources and Accessible Sciences 5.0. I say Professor T.S. Dr. Mahfaiz Faiz Muhammad Amin, Dean of Faculty of Earth Science, CITRAS 5.0 Committee Members, Local and International Presenter and Participants. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Presenter and Participants, First and foremost, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome and thank all of you for participating in our fifth virtual international conference on Tropical Resources and Sustainable Sciences 5.0. For four consecutive, consecutive years, UMK has once again maintained its performance in successfully organizing the fifth international conference on Tropical Resources and Sustainable Sciences also known as CITRAS 5.0. It is UMK mission to be the epicenter for sharing state-of-the-art technology and knowledge in order to reach the highest level of sustainable development growth. This conference provides a great platform for discussion and sharing of present scientific knowledge and findings across a range of environmental sustainability issues alongside the 17 SDG goals at both the national and international levels, including good health and well-being, clean water and sanitation, and life on land. Now, these natural resources are often reviewed as key assets, driving development and wealth creation. Over time, and with progressive industrialization, resource utilization increase. In some cases, exploitation levels came to exceed resources natural regeneration rates. Such over-appreciation ultimately treats the livelihoods and well-being of people who depend on these resources, eventually jeopardizing the health of ecosystem. Henceforth, we need fundamental shift in fostering secular resource use and secular economics as extreme in the United Nations 2030 Agenda for 
sustainable development goals with governments aiming to achieve the sustainable management and efficient use of natural resources by 2030. Today, CITRES 5.0 highlights four significant topics in line with the conference theme, Sustaining Natural Resources Wealth Through Responsible Stewardship. With this platform in the present circumstances, it is time for us to contemplate on existing natural resources and environmental issues where interdisciplinary discussion and networking would enhance better understanding to sustain our valuable natural resources. We do hope to keep the momentum going and persistently engage with fellow researchers, academicians, and global communities to collaborate together to achieve the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Till then, wishing all 170 CITRAS 5.0 presenters from Austria, China, India, Nigeria, Pakistan, Philippines, Indonesia, and Malaysia for a great success in all possible respects. I take this pleasure in declaring the fifth International Conference on Tropical Resources and Sustainable Sciences 2023 officially open. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Dr. Dr. Razli Cik Razak for the welcoming speech. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the core agenda for our meeting today. We are very honored to have Dato Abdul Qadir Abu Hashim as a keynote speaker. This first keynote speaker station will be moderated by Mr. Nor Hizami Hassin. Please welcome Mr. Nor Hizami.
Thank you, Madam MC. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Hi, good day to everyone. I am Nur Hizami Hassin. Will be your moderator for the first keynote speaker session in this prestigious event, Citrus 5.0 2023. Before I proceed, I would like to inform that this event is officially live on UMK's social media platforms through through Facebook and also YouTube. All the respected audience are allowed to drop any comments. or questions related to the topic that the speaker will present after this first of all i would like allow me to briefly highlight the background of our honorable first keynote speaker for this event datu abdul kadir bin abu hashim director general of the department of wildlife and national park peninsula malaysia commonly known as a perhilitan has over 31 years of experience in perhilitan since 1992 as for his academic background datuk has received his first degree in forestry management from university putra malaysia then he obtained his master of science from the university of leeds united kingdom in biodiversity and conservation recognizing his expertise in conservation and wildlife management He has been appointed as a professor adjunct by University Putra Malaysia and a visiting professor by University Malaysia Terengganu. As Director General of Perhilitan, he is also responsible for formulating strategic plans for Malaysia Wildlife Protection Foundation. Dr Abdul Kadir is now a patron of Public Service Counseling Associate called ACRA. and a patron of sport and welfare club perhilitan last but not least datu is given the privilege to serve as a president malaysia association of zoological park and aquaria maspa okay i think uh, uh, we have uh, datu here assalamualaikum datu nice to meet you Nice to meet you. I'm Hizami here. How are you today? Uh, fine, thank you. All right. So I hope everything is fine, Dato. So uh, I think uh, as uh, we understand, we have a one-hour session for your first keynote speaker, prime presentation. So uh, before we start from uh, with your prime presentation, uh, I believe uh, we have a couple of video. during your presentation is it right dato yeah well, i have two videos to to show to the uh, to, to this uh, audience uh, audience all right okay that that could be interesting for me and audience to watch it all right so uh, because of we have uh, only one hour to to listen your presentation and also we have q and a session at the end of the session so without a further ado uh, let us uh, hear the presentation uh, by dato with the title uh, wildlife guardianship sustaining life and preserving natural resources through responsible stewardship the platform is your dato uh, thank you mr moderator Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Malaysia Kanta YMK. Um, my name is Abdul Kadir Abouashin. I'm the Director General for the Department of Wildlife and National Parks, also known as Perhiditan. Gentlemen, ladies, will be given the task of presenting the keynote species entitled Wildlife, Guardianship, Sustaining Wildlife and Preserving Natural Resources Through a Responsible Stewardship. In today's Citrus 5.0 series is uh, truly an honor. Before I proceed to go in depth about this topic, uh, I would like to share with the audience uh, our corporate video showcasing challenges 
actions and initiative that the time uh, has been your to ensure the survival of our wildlife for future generations. Uh, thank you.
Okay, this is uh, in house video. Um, um, the next slide is that there are uh, three lists that Pakistan adheres to under the constitution. First, the federal list. Uh, when the country is involved in international parties or matters, such supporting or actions needed to be carried out. For this, Pakistan is a member of the International Convention of Biological Diversity (CBD) and also the Convention of the <laughs> Endangered Species of Fauna and Flora (CITES). We will assist. We will assist in the reporting and carry out the programs later. Currently, Britain is under purview of the Ministry of Natural Resources, Environment and Climate Change (NRECC). Cities, as uh, mentioned in, in the Constitution, all land and forestry matters is listed under the state's jurisdiction. However, for the wildlife and national park management, falls under the concurrent list under the Constitution. Uh, thus, any matters pertaining wildlife or protected areas uh, matters will always be consulted in the states from time to time. Ladies and gentlemen, to spearhead wildlife conservation in Peninsula Malaysia is a huge task that needs cooperation from various stakeholders, including the state government, corporate bodies, NGOs, universities, and the public. Sadly, the challenges in the wildlife conservation involve factors such as, first, the increase in human wildlife conflict, which can be due to encroachment to its habitats. Secondly, wildness and poachers. Although we are heading towards modernization, the hunger for forest products, including wildlife, is still, is still present. Thirdly, wildlife road kills, as shown in the video just now, Despite the mitigation methods carried out at the hotspot areas, the wildlife for kills still happens from time to time. Fourth, illegal wildlife trade, with the increase of social mediums and constant change of smuggling techniques, are some of the challenges we face upon carrying out enforcement work. Five, the presence of lunatic diseases. The department works closely in situ Communical research and are to, to monitor on zoonotic diseases, diseases from time to time. Um, Britain uh, strategy initiative, we have eight key areas as shown here. So our work not only covers on wildlife protection, conservation, and enforcement, but also covers on wildlife forensics work, wildlife in situ and ex situ conservation public awareness, productive cultural activities, and management of national parks, such as Taman Negara. <clears throat> Britain implements various acts and enactments in Peninsula Malaysia, as listed in this, in, in this slide. The Parliament of Malaysia had approved the Wildlife Conservation Bill and major amendments recently, including a higher penalty up to uh, 1 million ringgit and jail less than 15 years if one is found guilty under Section 71 under the Act 716, which covers importing, exporting, or re-exporting totally protected species without special permit. Um, currently, there are 43 protected areas under the purview of Piritan, and this slide indicates a few of the major protected areas under us. Uh, there are about 663,000 hectares under, under the jurisdiction of Greater. Um, aside of monitoring via land, either on foot or transportation, we also using drones and have established drone units all over Peninsula Malaysia. Um, the biodiversity patrolling and protection program BP3 started in 2019 to coincide with the implementation of the Safe Our Malaya Tiger Campaign. Under the wing of MP3, two specific initiatives were introduced, which is Biodiversity Integrated Operation, or Operasi Bersepatu Hazada, or OBK, which was implemented in 2019 and Community Radio Program uh, enforced in the year of 2000. 
2020. Our BK is an integrated operation involving the enforcement agencies and local NGOs. This operation is an integrated enforcement operation to protect our protected areas, the main habitats for our wildlife, and also to eradicate <laughs> Uh, presented under the MSC and RCC has implemented the Community Ranger Initiative under the BTT program. This program was previously known as BETWA, Veterans uh, or ASAR, which, however, we have enhanced to include the local community as well. The Community Rangers expected to further enhance the border control of protected areas, the effectiveness of detection of cases in areas of encroachment hotspots, poaching, logging, including snare clearance operation. So in this slide, I would like to, to talk about OBK's footprints from 2020 to 2022. Uh, since 2022 until 2020 to 2022, OBK has patrolled around 500,000 kilometers. So until July 2023 alone, a total of six series of mobility operations that have been carried out, a total of 43 investigation papers have been opened involving 78 criminal offenders, which a total of 76, 76 snares have been successfully destroyed. The total value of the consultation was around 11.3 million ringgit. We are proud to inform that our vehicle operations were acknowledged by the UN Environment Programme and was one of the winners of the ASEAN Environmental Enforcement Awards for fighting transboundary environmental crime in 2020. Um, they, um, based on these figures, we have destroyed a total of uh, 1,364 illegal camps and 1,120 snares, among other, among others under this OBK program. And as we know, oysters uh, uh, are very little to our life. Uh, I take this opportunity to share with you on the rescue of Pancho. Uh, there is our Malayan tapi that was injured due to our snake. Our team, including our veterinarians, work hard to ensure Pancho of course with us. Now, let's see the, the video.
orang right. uh, they said it looks about the pancho the battle tapi has been uh, threat by wise name uh, now he's safe in the sukai which in the national wildlife rescue center well um In 2023, we have employed a total of 932 community rangers, and they have patrolled a total of about 57,000 kilometers. Um, we also have the scanner unit. We uh, have also created a new unit, the scanner unit, in June 2019, which will focus on border patrol, specifically spot checks in airports. And other exit checkpoints like Bukit Kalita. Currently, we have two dogs for this purpose. Other in situ efforts include carrying out wildlife inventories at forest reserves and wildlife reserves. Based on these inventories, the department use use this reports to assist the e, in EIA evaluations or any project development in the areas. That is uh, an element. In these five years alone, Britain has received a total of 55,358 complaints for the public on the human wildlife conflict accuracy, uh, which is happening in, in the area. In this year alone, we have received a total of 6,378 complaints related to human wildlife conflict. Uh, this top by wildlife species that causes major conflicts, including the destruction to crops, properties, and even threatening, threatening life, are the long-term marker, wild boar, elephants, horse event, and big-tail marker. Um, about the roadkill hotspot areas, sadly our wildlife is not only threatened by encroachment or poachers, the number is increasing due to roadkills. Previously, just small mammals, snakes or birds were involved, but now it is not impossible to find key animals such as tigers, elephant, wild boar and tail as roadkill, which we seen on the first video just now. The map uh, shows the major root kill spots in Peninsula, Malaysia. The blue zone is serious, but the red zone are the areas with the highest number of wildlife root kills. Various mitigation methods uh, have been carried out, including identification of 130 areas as hotspot for wildlife crossing, and a total of 236 signboards was deployed to alert the road user. Usage of other tools such as uh, transverse bar, barbed wire, and amber lights also are introduced to facilitate the mitigation. So under our ex situ conservation efforts, the Hilton had also uh, established 13 wildlife conservation centers throughout Peninsula Malaysia and involved uh, various local, species, local wildlife species such as the barking deer, Um, Malayan Gau, Tape, Terpin, Agus, Pangolin, to near few. We also have two wildlife rescue centers uh, in Selangor and Perak to place the wildlife confiscated from enforcement uh, cases. Although uh, the exit research unit and the lab is relatively new, we are proud that so many achievements have been achieved in a short time due to dedication from military staff. Among the achievements, uh, first, the Malaysia Book of Records. That is, uh, Britain was awarded with the largest collection of wildlife biomaterial. Uh, but the title the Malaysian Book of Records uh, throughout, throughout Malaysia, a total of 18,310 biometric collection from 386 species were collected, which includes tissues, meat, skin, fur, blood, cement, and others. Uh, case studies of uh, wildlife pathology in Malaysia uh, publication which Britain was involved in the publication of this book with the cooperation of Malaysian Association of Veterinary Pathology, MAVP. The book was among the first of its kind on wildlife pathology in Malaysia. And then the National Wildlife Forensic Laboratory and the WFL 
was the first uh, lab established dedicated to analyzing wildlife forensics in Malaysia. Uh, also, under our existing conservation efforts, data had also established the National Wildlife Forensic Lab. And the lab is now an ISO aggregated lab, which is responsible for forensic analysis, research uh, to genetic and zoonotic surveillance under the wildlife species surveillance program that is the Bali UDSP. About the general of, uh, of wildlife and parks, currently there are 37 uh, general uh, of wildlife and parks issued since 1982, including a total of 453 papers have been published, and we are currently aiming to be on the Scopus Index this day. Uh, Britain uh, works hand in hand with local universities in conducting research on wildlife conservation. Uh, bear in mind that all researchers, both locally and internationally, must submit an application to Britain uh, first prior to conducting wildlife related work. From 2017 until June 2023, we have issued a total of 479 research permits to universities and, and uh, government agencies. Meanwhile, uh, for uh, our department, we have research officers, arrows, conducting research on various scopes such as wildlife breeding, wildlife checklist, wildlife diet, wildlife genetics, zoonotic diseases, and many others. Many of our research studies have been published or presented in both local and international seminars. For ecotourism sites, we have managed just eight ecotourism sites around Peninsula Malaysia, including Taman Negara National Park, Indian National Park, and the National Elephant Conservation Centre. So the highest number of visitors involves uh, uh, National Elephant Conservation Center, followed by Penang National Park and Taman Negara National Park. But as you can see, there is a decline in 2020 to 2021 due to the pandemic. Um, ETA also carried out various awareness programs through collaborations, education programs, training programs and uh, networking with various stakeholders, both locally and internationally. Um, as you can see, uh, many efforts have been taken by the government uh, in ensuring the conservation of our life. And nevertheless, it is not an only role to be undertaken by the government. The role of corporate police, environmental NGOs, academia, and the media are crucial in implementing the responsibilities of creating awareness among the younger generation and gathering public support for tiger conservation and wildlife protection in general. I also call upon the uh, support of the public to come together and support the government's effort in fulfilling the commitments to conserve the Malay tiger, a species that is the pride of the country a symbol of sovereignty and the government of Malaysia. The task plan has been created called Save Our Malayan Tigers, has been created for this purpose. Companies and other agencies are welcome to contribute in the trust plan to help cover for the enforcement, conservation, and awareness activities plan. Um, among departments, uh, future focus are uh, First, managing human wildlife conflict to ensure the safe being of both wildlife and humans. And then, enhancement of wildlife forensics, as this is a needed field in the world of enforcement. And at the same time, Malaysia is currently one of the main reference for wildlife forensic work. And then, conducting of wildlife uh, species operation program, either via in situ or actually program. And we are also currently continuing the Save Our Malayan Tiger campaign until 2030 to get further engagement from corporate bodies and also the continuation of OBK and the Ranger community. Um, 
the history of Beta uh, in growth and challenges, initiatives uh, being carried out uh, in future of wildlife conservation are all explained in the book of Asperasi and Chaparan, Musa de Palia, the expression and challenges in wildlife management. Currently, the book is in Bahasa version, but we will try to do uh, it in English version soon. I think that is all for this morning. Uh, and with that, I end my presentation today, which is less than one hour. Thank you. Okay, Alhamdulillah. Thank you very much, Dato. Very insightful presentation that you have presented just now. Uh, I believe uh, we receive a lot of information and knowledge today, okay, uh, which is very uh, important uh, for any of us to protect and conserve our wildlife species, especially that I believe uh, about the uh, Pantera tigris jetsoni, which is called as a Malayan tiger, right? Uh, Harimau Malaya, right? And then uh, we can see, uh, for instance, uh, various effort and also action uh, that uh, that has been taken uh, seriously. Uh, from your agency uh, to save and sustaining our wildlife species. All right, Dato. Uh, so since we have a couple of time, a few uh, uh, time allocation for the Q and A session. So if you don't mind, uh, if I address some uh, question uh, to you, Dato. Okay. All right. Okay. So that uh, you have presented a lot uh, of uh, story just now, uh, uh, within uh, from your presentation. Uh, I just want to know: uh, Can you share uh, any success story and positive uh, outcomes uh, that have been uh, achieved through wildlife guardianship initiative? Um, thank you, Mr. Uh, as um, as you uh, can observe, or did to observe uh, uh, the video, the presentation, one of uh, among the achievements, uh, uh, other than that, we also have our uh, subject matter expert department. Uh, now we have uh, two hours. Subject the next word. One is uh, for the elephant, uh, elephant. the other one is for uh, birds, migrating birds. So, anything to do with uh, uh, conflict or anything to do with elephant, uh, this uh, SME uh, will manage and answer all the questions. Same with the uh, for the Migrating, migrating birds. Other than that, as you, as I said just now, uh, we have uh, achieved in uh, this OBK and also the community program. Other than that, uh, uh, we also have our research unit, uh, which conducted wildlife inventory or wildlife uh, survey. Uh, Throughout, throughout the year, and we have uh, lots of data on 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 that. Okay, all right. That, so uh, uh, this is a lot of success story, and maybe we will come more later. Okay. Uh, so that uh, I believe uh, that community is uh, community role role of community is very important uh, for wildlife sus uh, for sustaining the wildlife and also to protect the wildlife species. So, uh, may I know how can individual and communities uh, contribute to wildlife guardianship, especially on a local level? Uh, I mean, um, uh, people outside the community can have, can can uh, can go to the nearest maritime office uh, to to apply for for this for this work. Uh, we we are now still uh, continuing uh, to to take uh, the to take many as as many as uh, uh, community rangers. Uh, we target about 
this year about 1,000, 1,000 million years. Yeah. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, 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 Dato. So it's okay. very important, eh? the okay. community involvement eh? to protect our yeah. wildlife uh, uh, instead of the role of the agency, right? Okay, since we are on the edge of the technology uh, uh, right now, so is it any uh, or how can technology and also innovation uh, be utilized to enhance wildlife guardianship? and monetary effort that too. Is it any technology that adapted to your uh, job or work? Yes. Some, which I, some which I can mention here that we, uh, we, also, we have this uh, fruit unit uh, which will cover the area that we want to survey and then we want to know what's happening around that about Five to ten kilometers square. Uh, what, what, what happened? So we set up a drone, and also we have this. Uh, we put our satellite collar, for example, to elephant to manage uh, the, to to determine their home range. Uh, so this will be easy for the department to manage uh, uh, this elephant population in in some conflict areas. Other than that, uh, we have this uh, smart program. Smart program is using uh, GPS to, mo to monitor uh, area that we survey. And what else? Uh, mm, I think there's a few I can mention here. Thank you. Right. So is a complement with the technology era right now, right? So to, to monitor because uh, we can see from your presentation, the monetary area is a really, really big size and, and wide. And, and, so, and one more, and one more. And we also uh, have a cooperation with other university, uh, such as UKM, um, yeah. UITM, UKM, uh, UPNM, and other universities too, to, to develop this uh, uh, technology uh, to manage wildlife uh, in the world. Yes, uh, I remember uh, one of my click uh, in our in my faculty, uh, Dr. Kamaru Arifin. Uh, he produced uh, one of the apps called Hacko, right? Uh, if not mistaken, uh, to monitor the uh, elephant elephant movement or elephant conflict actually uh, with the community. Oh, this is uh yeah this is uh, the importance of the technology uh recently right uh okay uh maybe i think there's one more last question a very uh, i think this is uh, the current issue the issues happened a few days ago uh, which is uh if you don't mind that if you can respond uh about the we had uh, we had about a uh, death case Okay, happen uh, somewhere at the Gua Musa regarding to the elephant. So actually, what are the reason uh, about the situation happen? If you can address that, any comment. That case of elephant in Gua Musa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lodging, if not mistaken. And pemancing Oh, this one. Uh, uh, death of uh, a guy who was trampled by elephant, is it right? Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, that because I, yeah. I, uh, I, I, as far as concerned, of course, we have to know the behavior of, of, of elephant. Uh, we cannot propose elephant because it's a wild elephant. Uh, usually, usually, in is it's, it's wild. So, although they looks very gentle, but uh, but you can you, you you cannot trust it. It's still a wife. So I believe uh, uh, these guys. They said uh, they, they he said that he was. Uh, I mean, uh, in, in 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 news they said he want to go for the fishing. Uh, I think he him uh, along the way he's probably he observed an elephant, and then 
Or maybe he going me on the elephant, maybe. And then the elephant uh, was surprised, and and the elephant charged, charged the, the, the man. I think so. This is this is not only the first uh, incident. There are few incidents uh, early this year and also last year and a few years ago about the uh, elephant uh, trample uh, human, which caused death. So in this case, I strongly believe uh, maybe the elephant is surprised and then it charged uh, the, the man there. Yeah. So that's it. Other than that, uh, usually, uh, Usually the, the elephant will just go away, uh, except uh, along the uh, Jili Highway, Jili Great Highway. Uh, yeah. People usually, conf, uh, usually uh, always call, uh, can see elephant on the road. So my advice is not to harm the elephant. Also, if at night, not to give uh, the highlight to the elephant. This, this will provoke the elephant and the elephant will, will charge at you. So just uh, let the elephant move from the other side, the other side to the other side, is it? Yes, yes. Yes, that's, uh, yes. Uh, this is what, what happened, right? Uh, because uh, actually the animal doesn't uh, attack the, the human unless they are threatened, right? Yeah. Uh, that's actually, uh, I want, uh, this is, that's, that's not it's, uh, the last question from me, but uh i see there is a uh, two question from the comment from uh, our audience uh if you don't mind can i read the questions from the facebook uh mk facebook okay if you don't mind. Uh, two questions the last question uh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> this, uh, we have a com uh, com uh question from the audience so i think uh, <laughs> I pick one one question only, one question. The last, very last question. <laughs> okay, uh, question from uh, Dr. Shohada Subki. Uh, he, uh, she asked about how can we enhance the awareness of the community on the wildlife conservation, uh, especially for the youngster? Um, oh, thank you for the question. Um, I think at, at present and the near future, the social media is very important because not only the uh, old generation, young generation, especially the young generation, they, they always use uh, social media to read. As one of uh, uh, one of the department uh, strategy uh, is to to, to put everything about wildlife in social media. Uh, we have the Facebook, uh, Instagram, and other social media, uh, uh, and also other social media. So if uh, audience want to know about uh, wildlife, they can surf to our social media, especially the Facebook. We, are, we always update every, almost every day, a current situation happening. The other one is to give a talk uh, to to uh, school or universities. This is what we have done for the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, and then uh, uh, also uh, we go uh, to this uh, night market of Makansari and then uh, we put our hunting or banner to give a talk to people outside there about, about our life. Uh, uh, now, what we do, we, we, we strategize to, to give a talk to school at the, uh, at the around uh, at the village area. Because they are the people, they are the ones that are near, that stay not far from the forest, which uh, uh, they know better than than, than the others. Uh, last time we focused on uh, urban school, but now we are moved to 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 outside outside uh, town. So, uh, for example, like the green area, Arling area, uh, uh, um, 
Terengganu such as Kuala uh, Berang area uh, for, for example. This, this will focus uh, uh, the student people uh, outside the uh, uh, city. That, that is our, our target. Now. This is what, what the Pelitan is, 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 uh, is doing now. All right. Thank you, Datuk, for all the response that you have given to us uh, just now. Okay, I think uh, that's all only. Uh, that's all only for the moment since we have a very a minimal time uh, because we have another speaker, right? uh, the second keynote speaker, uh, keynote speaker after this for this event. Right. So I believe, uh, Datuk, you have so many things that you want to share with us, but uh, unfortunately, uh, as we understand we have a limited time so maybe uh, we can have a, another session next time if you don't mind that to uh, another program or whatever right okay so Dato, thank you very much for your valuable time and thank you for having with us okay thank you very much uh, i would like to take this opportunity to thank to you and the dmj and if the audience have questions after this, they can just uh, email uh, to the department. I think uh, that's it. Thank you again. All right, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, if you don't mind, uh, uh, you can respond uh, if the any question from our Facebook uh, social media. Uh, there's another question actually, but I just pick one only because we have a limited time just now. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much, Dato. Once again, uh, thank you also for all audience and participant through our social media platform. I think that's all for, for this first keynote speaker session. Till we meet again. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Mr. Rizan Hasin, for moderating the keynote session. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we will proceed with the session, uh, with the second keynote session of CPRES 5.0. Without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Muhammad Azhar Abbas, the Senior Lecturer for Faculty of Earth Science University, Malaysia, Kelantan, to moderate the session. Please welcome Dr. Azhar Abbas.
welcome back to the Citrus 4.0. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and participants, welcome to the second keynote sessions of Citrus 5.0. My name is Muhammad Azahar bin Abbas and I have the honor of moderating this session today. And I am very grateful because we have an esteemed speaker who will be sharing his insight on the medicinal plants as the resources for human wellness. Before that, uh, let me explain how this session will be conducted. This session consists of two parts. The first part is the sharing from the, our speakers. The second part is the question and answer sessions. For those who have any questions, please drop your questions at the comment sessions. And let me introduce our keynote speaker for today. His name is Professor Technologist Dr. Pasupaliti Viswara Rao, also known as Professor Rao. He is the Director of International Relations and Research Collaboration at Reva University, India, since 2022. He is an expert in the plant biotechnology and he has been appointed as the adjunct professor at the Taylor University, Malaysia, and also at the Asian Institute of Medical Science and Technology, Malaysia. He also has been appointed as the visiting professor at the Universitas Abdurrahman, Indonesia. And, and the most amazing about Professor Rao is that he was been featured as a top 2% scientist in the world by the Stanford University for three times in a row, since 2020 until 2022. And I believe his expertise and knowledge will undoubtedly inspire us today. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Rao. Prof, thank you so welcome. much. Prof, yeah, welcome to Citrus 5.0, Prof. Thank you so much. Uh, How are you doing, Monica. Prof? Yeah, I'm doing How good. Doing, thank Prof? you so much. Okay, Prof. Uh, I think without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Rao to share with us his insight entitled Green Medicines, Fostering Human Wellness and Environmental Abundance with Venetian Plants. Uh, Prof Rao, the stage is yours. Thank you. Are my slides visible? Uh, I think, no, sir. No, Prof. I didn't see your slide presentations. Okay, Can you just uploading now. Uh, try again to, be, to share your slide presentation?
Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Moderator, and uh, the whole team of CTRES, the management of UMK, for having me here for this conference. Uh, well, let me proceed with my green medicine, fostering human wellness and environmental abundance with medicinal plants. Yeah, let us uh, have a look into the sustainable development goals, which were the work we do, the research we do. Then it must be helpful to the environment. It must be helpful to the world. So accordingly, the research, what's happening, especially at my laboratory, will be in line with a you know, few of the sustainable development goals, especially good health and well-being and also clean water and sanitation and few other you know, important aspects, which is life on land and life below water as well. And recently, some of the areas which have been uh, involved with climatic action and other areas of SDGs. So basically, when we talk about medicinal plants or when we talk about uh, geography of the world or when we talk about uh, the importance of medicinal plants or herbal medicine or human wellness, it is completely involving with environment uh, aspects. Basically, when we talk about plants, so it is actually estimated that 15 million of 15 millions of different plants are available in the world. However, when we take the plants or medicinal plants into consideration, there are very little number of plants are being available to be used as medicinal plants or herbal medicine. So this is how usually we try to divide the plants and we try to collect the plants from various sources or various uh, geographical locations, including forests. And uh, even when I was uh, uh, in UMK for a long term, then we, we used to go, go to lots of Bhutans and then we try to collect the plants to get the elements, beneficial elements from the plants. So that is where we consider the polyphenols or flavonoids for the human wellness usually is called as phytomedicine. However, new species are being found recently and then we are trying to work on various aspects of uh, uh, different plants and different parts of them to provide better human wellness through these sustainable sciences or sustainable resources what we have across the world and especially the Southeast Asian countries and Asian countries. Let me uh, give you a gist of what is the global demand of medicinal plants and I must acknowledge this for uh, National Botanical uh, you know, Board of India. So this is what actually the global market value of herbal industry. So seeing the current scenarios and recently we have been witnessed with, uh, with a uh, great pandemic, which is COVID-19 and then herbal medicine or medicinal plants or natural products, they have played a bigger role in, you know, in trying to stop the consequences of COVID-19, which which is a you know dreadful disease which we all of us have seen or have witnessed about it. So accordingly, uh, WHO the global market value for herbal industry is expected to reach five trillion dollars in 2050. So if you observe the growth of this particular uh, uh, you know graph, so there is a gradual and also tremendous increase. Uh, of the global market value of herbal industry, which means the people are trusting herbal medicine or natural products are turning towards natural products, you know, is drastically increasing. Whereas allopathic medicine has its own value. It doesn't mean that so we are, we are trying to demotivate the uh, value or the, the importance of allopathic medicine. However, the action of allopathic medicine is quite prompt and then uh, we also can expect the unwanted or undesired side effects using uh, allopathic medicine. However, 
the medicinal plants have very less and no side effects. That's why the researchers nowadays are paying much attention towards the natural products or bio biological products or bioproducts to treat human ailments and also the other consequences for the elements. I'd like to give you a, a small scenario of Indian system, how the status of medicinal plants in India and what exactly is you know uh, the practice since the ancient times. Because you know, when we are talking about herbal medicine, Ayurveda, Siddha, Yunani, India is, is a, one of the very pioneering countries to practice these things, you know, uh, along with Chinese traditional medicine. So if you observe in this slide, so we have 20 agroecological zones. So again, this I acknowledge to the Indian Botanical Board. Uh, one of the 17 mega biodiversity countries where the rich biodiversity and various kinds of medicinal plants have been observed. And 7% of world biodiversity is being observed in India. Whereas 17,000 flowering plant species have been identified and then there are about uh, 17,000 medicinal plants which can be used for various types of diseases starting from fever until even communicable, non-communicable diseases as well. So about 9,000 species used in uh, you know various kinds of medicines and 1,172 uh, species in trade of which 242 with consumption more than 100 metric tons. So 40% of species are in very, very high demand where even the biopharmaceutical industries are making pills and then they are distributing not only to uh, Asian region, but also to the world. So a uh, few of the important medicinal plants are being in very popular since you know, a few decades. A large network of institutions and industries are involved in medicinal plant research, not only institutions and universities, but there are so many R&D centers where they give a high priority for this natural product research. And also they try to increase the alarming status. Uh, you know, they try to increase the availability for the alarming status for various new pandemics and epidemics. So this is another, uh, you know, uh, slide which depicts about uh, the India is the repository of more than 7,500 plants. But now at the current scenario, we are quoting that more than 8,000, uh, 8, uh, you know, plants. Maybe I excuse for uh, 20 seconds. I'm sorry, it was for National Anthem. Yeah, so if, so the slide clearly depicts that it's a repository of more than 7,500 medicinal plants. However, now the updated uh, system, we are considering that more than 8,000 plants, medicinal plants are being used for various diseases. And also we collect them from Himalayan region. So Himalayan is, is one of the you know very important areas and the hilly areas, which uh, I think many majority of the participants might know, the uh, mountains where we get lots of medicinal plants and the, it's, a, it's a hub for medicinal plants. And we also collect the you know herbal sources from marine and also desert uh, to rainforest ecosystems. So accordingly, we will try to identify the extractions and also we will try to identify the phytochemicals or polyphenols where we try to adjust the
capacity of the medicinal medicinal plants or extracts or the volumes to the deceased people so demand of medicinal plants from health sector so as as we have discussed in earlier slide also as i have mentioned very clearly that the importance and also the attention towards medicinal plant research or herbal medicine or bio products is been literally uh, you know encouraging and also the demand has been uh, more these days and about 2500 plant species are used in the codified system of medicine practices in india and the denomination has been given here for ayurveda siddha yunani sovarigpa homeopathic and western medicine so various kinds of uh, medicinal plants and their species have been identified and then used for different types of medicinal practices and the the cure was you know uh, literally confi confident that the cure was given by these particular systems and another thing when when you are using medicinal plants for the health sector especially so there are lots of studies have to be conducted to authenticate the you know originality of the usage and originality of the work and demand of raw herbal drugs growth and trends so you can observe again from 1999 to 2015 there is again tremendous growth for the demand so this is only an estimated demand during these years so again it is going day by day and it is increasing uh, you know as everybody is evidencing it and now what we call it as organic farming and organic foods so this has been a trending word now where everybody is talking about organic foods so we don't use bio fertilizers we don't use and we don't harm environment all these kind of stuff so but the system we have and the system is been practiced not only in india but but also various parts of the world even even i was there in malaysia for about 12 years so even in malaysia they they have you know a very good system for using herbal medicine and also the world traditional medicine so it is not you know singularly for particular region or particular country but across the world the practice of using medicinal plants or herbal medicine or biological products are been in practice but the only thing is to get understanding to get better understanding and also to understand the things in a better way so everybody should get awareness first before understanding it we have to understand why we are using this particular drug or why we are using this particular herb it can be in the raw form it can be in the formulated form because now another trending point is the polyherbal formulations so polyherbal formulations usually are gaining more importance nowadays because one particular herb may not be having different functions but uh, when we have polyherbal formulation the intact or the efficacy of the you know product may be higher than a particular single compound so that is why now the attention towards polyherbal formulations are been increasing tremendously and also there is a need of this raw material because raw material has been in demand in the recent times where we have to cultivate the herbal herbal plants or herbal uh, gardens in a private lands when we talk about supply chain of medicinal plants this is exactly just now i was mentioning about uh, the increase of demand increase in demand in medicinal plants or herbs or biological products then we cannot only depend on forests but we also can do other kind of supplies where we can reach or we can try to uh, suffice the product level of the or produce of herbal medicines or herbs so in this picture you can clearly observe that we usually uh, collect the medicinal plants from the forest where uh, i have mentioned very clearly that we have been collected lots of plants or we have been collecting lots of uh, you know uh, species from different parts of malaysian region so that's about forest then from wild collectors we go to the mediator level 1 which is again rural levels then mediator level 2 district levels so from from very 
remote areas we collect the plants and then we send it to various regions for different processes and apart from that if you observe we also have cultivars so where the the cultivators grow the plants and then they try to you know complete the process in their particular private land including manufacturing unit of herbal products so if we observe here from the cultivator the manufacturing unit of herbal products where they do they, they continuously do this collection identification identification collection and then drying process extractions or based on the isolation or crude extracts they will try to determine determinate the or bifurcate the individual plant uh, species and then they try to go for herbal formulations or even crude extractions as well then what exactly the cultivars do is the cultivars try to supply the herbs or supply the medicinal plants to the suppliers where they try to understand exactly what is the market and then finally they process everything to the product and they will try to send it to the markets and when the demand is more for national markets they will send it to the domestic domestic markets and certain level of products bio products they usually send it to overseas markets where the demand is high there are some of the species of medicinal plants and some of the species of herbs are very much important for certain markets according to the temperatures and according to their diseases so these are various elements for a strategy herbal medicinal products when we we want to sell the products and when we want to uh, bring the products into the market so we have to identify the products how the product is going to be uh, uh, you know uh, strategically implemented in that particular market and also we need to understand whether the product is new or well established to be suitable to that particular market and we have to be prepared the researchers or scientists or even the persons who have established this herbal industry to prepare themselves whether they suit for the industrial demands and needs or not otherwise there will be lots of if, if the proper preparation is not seen in the process certainly the failures will will take place even though there is a huge demand for herbal products but they have to move very strategically to you know to satisfy the needs and requirements of particular market either it can be a domestic or it can be a overseas so identifying stakeholders also uh, is very important at times because you cannot always rely on particular market thereby we have to depend on industries medical doctors pharmacists and other healthcare providers so whenever there is a need and requirement then probably the product has to reach them and then we have to finalize the things accordingly so keeping all these things in mind and then when whenever we are talking about natural products so i have given few plants which which we have conducted work in uh, especially in malaysia so these are the various medicinal plants we have worked and then even uh, including stingless bunny uh, stingless bee honey which we had a form in uh, university of malaysia klanten as well so various kinds of uh, uh, southeast asian plants are been well known for different types of biological activities including anti diabetic anti cancer anti inflammatory even including communicable diseases as well so these are the various plants usually uh, we have worked on the team has worked on these particular plants and then we have identified lots of biological activities especially on uh, metabolic diseases including diabetes cancers Cardiovascular, cardiovascular diseases and neurodegenerative disorders that's why we always believe the natural product researchers or scientists we say nature is a sustainable thing which we have to save it we have to protect it so that nature will again protect us so this is what since our childhood we learn so now we also have to practice that the nature is the treasure for us and this is the only sustainable thing so people come and go however nature is sustainable and we have we have 
the responsibility and right to save the nature so that nature will certainly protect us. So coming uh, to understand clearly about herbal medicine and the research, what we have done further. So uh, here, uh, this particular slide is clearly depicting about Ayurvedic medicine. And Ayurvedic medicine, as I have mentioned in previous slides also, it's one of the very, very, very ancient uh, Indian medical healthcare system, which used to treat various type of disorders and diseases through this particular herbal extractions. And as an alternative mode of treatment, this has also been very known for less toxic or even no toxicity with more efficaciousness in the uh, treatment. And another important thing when we want to talk about uh, herbal medicine or Ayurvedic or even uh, medicinal plant uh, extractions and their availability and also efficacy in the human system, once the disease is clearly been identified and then treated with herbal medicine. So the efficacy will be about 99.99% and the recurrence will be, you know, very, very, very less. So that's why the herbal plants are provided, uh, are proved as useful resources to prevent or ameliorate certain disorders such as disease, uh, diabetes, atherosclerosis and other complications, as I have mentioned, other metabolic disorders as well, where they usually work on, try to work on various kinds of metabolisms, including lipid metabolism, carbohydrate metabolism, and protein metabolic diseases as well. So the most important thing which plants, fruits, or any natural products which we are talking about contains antioxidants. So antioxidants are generally the compounds which has high value of protecting agents amongst many of the polyphenols, flavonoids or phenolic compounds. And some of them are very much available in dietary, but some of them, uh, we, we, you know, the body also has some sort of antioxidants. But in a nutshell, if I want to explain these antioxidants, they are the heroes against the villains of free radicals. For, again, free radicals are the cells or free radicals or the compounds which try to penetrate into the body during their favorable conditions and try to damage the cells, having, you know, containing their favorable conditions into the cell and finally they will damage the cell. If we have sufficient antioxidants or if we take sufficient antioxidants, then the damaging of the cells or tissues or the organs may be reduced. So there are various kinds of antioxidants based on the plant part which we take based on the region which we take. So the antioxidants play an important role in the human systems and also to uh, ameliorate the complications, especially complications of metabolic diseases. And these are uh, different things which I have just mentioned for a general uh, audience. So they usually play an uh, important role in human wellness and then this is not a new thing we are not talking today. This particular human wellness and also through this particular herbal medicine or biological products is been available since ancient times. So we only have to do is create more awareness about it. And we only have to do is to uh, share knowledge to the people how to use this herbal medicine and also biological products. There is a lots of... Uh, uh, you know, potential with medicinal plants and herbal drugs usage because they have, as I have mentioned in uh, one of my earlier slides as well, they have very less or no side effects. However, when, when uh, you know, it's been evidently said in many of the researches and also even in practical times, there is lots of, uh, there are lots of unwanted or undesired side effects using various kinds of allopathic or, uh, you know, synthetic drugs. So drugs from plants is an alternative form of medicine which have less toxicity and shows fewer or no side effects to the patients. So that's the reason, not only, as I have mentioned earlier as well, not only one region of the globe, several regions of the globe, they are trying to depend on these drugs from the plants, which, which we are talking now about herbal medicine. So 
environment saves human beings human beings have to save environment in fact there is lots of damage to the environment now through the human uh, deeds whatever the whom humans are doing now they are showing lots of impact and then again the aff effect uh, uh, affecting agents are human beings now yeah and here are some of the uh, you know uh, products which i i would like to uh, mention here bio based drugs or medicines are commercial or significant value products from the biological sources so here uh, which i have uh, covered this vinegar this is actually the uh, one of our collaborative works which is a vinegar from dokong and rambutan so even the mm, you know uh, in main invention is from university of malaysia klantan and we have also done lots of work on uh, various types of uh, stingless bee honeys where again it relates to environment and also human wellness so majority of the sustainable things majority of the resources what we take is from the nature and then again we are giving back to the nature in the form of treatment and in the form of uh, uh, you know various products so that is the beauty of nature that is the beauty of uh, the natural product researches and this is another uh, important you know bio product which i would like to emphasize here is about what is coconut oil which we have conducted as you know preliminary work and also later on a uh, depth work about uh, vco virgin coconut oil with one of the indonesian partners so where we have found various kinds of uh, beneficial activities through applying this vco you know uh, about a teaspoon every day so increasing hdl cholesterol kills bacteria and viruses of various types protects skin and increases the glow so this is one of the evident uh, and significant characteristic of coconut oil and virgin coconut oil because if if many majority of the participants might know that kerala is one of the uh, you know important or prominent areas of india which you produces lots of coconut oil and then they use coconut oil for various you know um, regular usages including cooking purposes so that is clearly evident it says that it protects skin and increases the glow where if we observe the uh, people from this particular region so the the skin texture and the glow is completely different from other regions of the uh, indian continent and uh, boosts immune system improves brain function helps in easy digestion and many more other uh, uh, biological activities this particular virgin coconut oil has got and this virgin coconut oil has been prepared using uh, cold press system so another example from our research again it is uh, related to complete sustainable uh, resources as well as environmental aspects honey bees so i would like to quote that without honey bees uh certainly the world cannot exist because they do lots of uh, cleaning processes in the uh, you know in the system so our research group has conducted a, you know a tremendous work on uh, honey honey bees uh, honey especially uh honey bee honey as well as stingless bee honey so these two different types of honey we have uh, tried to work on to understand what exactly are the components they consist and then what exactly uh, mechanism of action they consist of uh, various biological activities especially including anti diabetic activity and other metabolic disorders we even we have used it for uh, neurodegenerative disorders and we have used this same thing for cardiovascular diseases and we have also used it for uh, uh, you know obesity related works so that that clearly says that the stingless bee honey uh, has higher antioxidant effects and also they have various kinds of uh, proteins which helps in you know identifying the metabolic functions and also identifying to ameliorate the uh, consequences of metabolic diseases because metabolic disease is not one disease it's a combination of disease even if you take diabetes it's it doesn't affect only the carbohydrate metabolism however it also increases the i mean fluctuates the metabolism of the groups
especially when we are talking about lipid metabolism, total cholesterol, triglycerides, and other parameters will get affected in the uh, in that particular metabolic disorder condition. Either it can be diabetes, it can be cardiovascular, it can be neurodegenerative, or it can be other disease as well. So additionally, stringless B is easier to handle, which they don't have strings, and then uh, very, very easy to handle and maintain uh, compared to the common B. So as I have again mentioned, and I have to, you know, admit that we had a uh, you know, stringless B form in the uh, University of Malaysia Clanton, where we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, grown few species of uh, this particular stingless bee honey, stingless bees, and then we try to produce honey. Finally, we work on various various kinds of biological activities uh, through that research. And I acknowledge Dr. Kumaratevan for that as well. And as we all know that uh, honey is a natural sweet substance and nothing, nothing much to be mentioned about this particular uh, uh, you know, product, natural product, and I, I must admit that there is a there is a clear saying in various uh, religious uh, books also, including Quran. The honey is one of the best products to be used very regularly for various kinds of health ailments, and other bee products, including bee venom, pollen, propolis, and royal jelly, are also being used for various kinds of biological activities. And anyways, here I, I focus only on honey. These are the various polyphenolic uh, groups which have been presented in various types of uh, medicinal plants, even in honey as well. Phenolic compounds, phenolic acid groups, and flavonoid groups, various kinds of uh, you know, phytochemicals you can observe in this slide, including gallic acid, uh, genstein, quercetin, Lutocholine, so caffeic acid, various kinds of phenolic acid groups you can observe. So these are all uh, having various kinds of uh, uh, one or other uh, important benefits to the human beings. And anyways, to talk about chemical structure of honey. So as I have mentioned again, it's, it's one of the natural resources or one of the natural products which has been used worldwide uh, since ancient times again. And uh, when we talk about the quality and uh, the research reports uh, have been established that Manuka honey is uh, uh, one of the premier honeys with high quality of biological activities. And when we talk about uh, honey from Malaysian region, we say it's Tualang honey is one of the you know, premier quality or best quality uh, honey, which contains lots of polyphenols and flavonoids. Uh, whereas when we talk about stingless bee honey as well, there are various kinds of beneficial activities when compared to uh, the sting honey, sting bee honeys. So at first uh, approximation, honey is the super saturated sugar solution. And why probably the audience may get the doubt that why honey and how honey can be a, an anti-diabetic agent or how it can be a component of a very regular food. So probably we can understand that very soon. And these are two different uh, you know, parts of uh, the honeycomb of sting bee honey and also honey pot of stingless bee honey, which we have represented this in Brazilian Journal of Pharmacognosy in the year 2015 or 16. So, we have clearly depicted the differences and you know bifurcations of stingless bee honey and also sting bee honey with various uh, potential and significant activities of these two. So these are this is again the information from the similar same paper, which we have clearly mentioned. What is the what is the difference between Tualang honey, Manuka honey, and stingless bee honey? Finally, we have compared the same thing with the International Honey Commission guidelines. Which, which has been published by Bognadov at all at, in 1999. So if you observe, there are various parameters we have seen appearance, starting from appearance until ash content and, uh, you know, uh, hydroxymethyl perfural, so HMF and electrical conductivity. So various parameters we have taken into consideration and we try to conclude that this particular honeybees or honey honeys which have been taken from various sources are being the
causative agents for various biological activities and then they do lots of uh, uh, you know uh, biological functions when uh, we consume them into uh, our system so to give you uh, you know a brief idea about uh, the biological activities of tualang honey or manuka honey or stingless bee honey uh, this is a basic information about uh, the biological activities what exactly a honey does antimicrobial activity so this antimicrobial activity uh, is very well known or very uh, obvious biological activity of honey if if we observe sometimes even the uh, honeys can be applied on the wounds very directly because it has got uh, very good antimicrobial activity and also it has got wound healing activity in fact one of our publications we have mentioned about uh, this particular honey and then wound healing so we, we even have prepared various kinds of nanoparticles or nano synthesis using various kind of biological uh, products or natural natural products so that we can we can identify better uh, biological properties of honey or even other biological products and it also has got anti inflammatory activity antioxidants as we have seen in the earlier slide anti diabetic activity anti cancers neurological disorders and of course uh, one of our team members have worked a lot on neurological disorders on honey anti diabetic my group has uh, done you know some significant work on stingless bee honey and probably that might be our that might be the first report across the world on anti diabetic activity of stingless bee honeys anti cancer yes of course we have worked on anti cancer some of the gastrointestinal tract diseases anti hyperlipidemic which again as a consequences of uh, or as a complications of diabetes or any metabolic disorders all the metabolisms will get altered so the lipid or the complete lipid profile will get disturbed and the uh, high density lipoproteins will get decreased thereby when we inject or when we consume these particular uh, biological products then certainly the, there is a balance in the lipid profiles or even the other parameters which we are going to uh, introduce to that particular study and cardiovascular diseases wound care reproductive system eye disorders etc again these are the examples of uh, anti hyperglycemic anti inflammatory and anti oxidant effects of honey so various kinds of honeys uh, have been observed for different types of functions and it's finally been concluded that the honey is a good source for anti hyperglycemic which is anti diabetic activities and also anti inflammatory and anti oxidant activities so this is basically about metabolic syndrome and anyways i have uh, clearly mentioned that metabolic syndrome is not a disease but it's a you know a combination of few diseases or few alterations in the body where carbohydrate metabolism lipid metabolism and protein metabolism will get altered and these are again various kinds of uh, you know biological activities of honey that's why we call it as a therapeutic agent synthetic drugs and of course for a fast reduction of a, you know disease or complications of the disease certainly we have to depend on synthetic drugs at the, at the moment and there is no other go uh, however using uh, synthetic drugs there are various reports and then the, uh, even the clinicians do say that there are some unwanted or undesired side effects however we cannot escape from that but the natural products and natural uh, resources or medicinal plants or herbs will possess very less toxic and there are no toxic effects on human system when we identify uh, the disease at the right time and when we apply the right dose of herbal products at the right time and these are other uh, you know uh, biological activities of honey where uh, alpha gl glucosidase alpha and beta amylase activities which are completely showing about anti diabetic activities and glucose oxidase as well catalase which again possess or uh, you know mentions about antioxidants proteases and esterases acid phosphatases various 
uh, parameters here uh, depicts different types of biological activities. So this particular, uh, you know, uh, pictorial representation clearly shows what are the biological activities it possesses and what are the parameters it can alter when we give this particular uh, uh, intervention, honey intervention into the human system or you know biological system of any mice or rat. So these are the parameters will go up and down. So that is how exactly it is depicted. When we take about, uh, when we consider antioxidant status of honey, usually the reactive oxygen species will be decreased and the increase in uh, antioxidants, which is superoxide, dismutase, catalase, and GSH. And in antihypertensive, you can see that blood, blood pressure has been uh, decreased, melandialdehyde is decreased, and they also upregulate the NRF2 which is one of the important uh, you know, parameters or which is one of the uh, very important modulator in uh, antihypertensive agents, you know, activity. And anti-inflammatory activity, cytokines, ROIS and TNF-alpha. So there is a high uh, level of increase in these particular, uh, you know, uh, agents. And then the decrease in this using honey has been observed. Whereas in lipid profile as well, you can see the VLDLC and LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, and total cholesterol have been decreased when there is an intervention with honey. And uh, anti diabetic antioxidants, you can see on your left. So, these are the beneficial things which happens when we take honey into the consideration as biological resources to have biological functions. Number one is insulin secretion, reduced food intake reduced fructosamine, antioxidant activities, and uh, prolongation of gastric emptying time so that, uh, you know, the absor absorption of glucose will be uh, more. And reduced intestinal absorption, alpha amylase and alpha glucose dis inhibitory activities also will be seen. And with great health benefits, honey not only has a significant supplement, but also has huge economic values through honeybee farming, Propolis, Royal Zindi, etc. And in a nutshell, if we want to understand how exactly the plant collection and what exactly it, it has been. So it's not that uh, uh, we just simply collect the plants and then we, we prepare the crude extracts or we isolate the products and then we try to give it to the human beings. No. So usually the pro process is very stringent. If a biological product, uh, product or uh, the, the herbal extract or herbal product to be released into the market, sometimes as a traditional medicine, so it will process through their own processes. However, the process, actual process is to be like this. So they have to go with preclinical trials. They have to conduct lots of toxicology studies. They have to conduct lots of biosis whether to confirm that particular compound is really working in the human system or not. And finally, they have to go for clin clinical studies. That is the reason very less number of biological or uh, herbal products are been uh, undergoing and getting permission from FDA for clinical trials and other things. Finally, once they get approval, so they are very much free to, you know, manufacture and also try to, uh, you know, promote that across the globe. So that is one of the important aspect and we have to understand this very clearly. And this particular uh, uh, slide clearly uh, you know, gives you an information about uh, uh, SARS-CoV infection, which is about COVID-19 and other uh, SARS viruses. So this, uh, this is just for your information. And finally, with this quote, I would like to uh, you know, uh, give you a glimpse of this particular talk, innovations that are guided by smallholder farmers adapted to local circumstances, sustainable for the economy and environment will be necessary to ensure food security in the future. See, as uh, in the future, for, for in the past slides, I have mentioned that every economic region or every geographical region has its own biodiversity, has its own medicinal plants, has its own importance and potential to grow the plants and to establish uh, herbal medicine platforms or any other kind of uh, you know innovations however according to the 
needs and requirements of the adapted local systems so we have to act so the same principle cannot be adapted for every conditions so certainly the principles must be uh, you know tailor made for each and every economic condition each and every local circumstances so this is uh, a brief uh, you know and potential publication about stingless bee honey and also bee honeys it's a very good uh, you know information to read and these are very few things which we have conducted and usage of herbal drugs must be always under the physician's monitoring it's uh, it, it is just not that you know uh, a herbal medicine researcher says that herbal medicine is the best but certainly we have to use the herbal drugs under the under a physician's monitoring because drugs are drugs and i also must admit here plants also possess lots of toxic elements that's why if you clearly understand my slide we have lots of millions of plants in the world but only 7500 plants are being considered as medicinal plants which means the other plants uh, may possess you know uh, low to very high potential toxic elements in those particular extractions yeah thank you this is all my research team earlier research team and research team uh, pictures have not been updated and thanks to my collaborators i think i am on time okay thank you professor rao for your very insightful presentations i think we get to know a lot from you about the medicine of plants i think uh, we are from malaysia especially from university of malaysia kelantan uh, i think uh, we can learn a lot from professor rao because we are uh, list listed one of the mega biodiversity in malaysia we have a lot of uh, species plant species in malaysia and then uh, i think uh, we we will now proceed with the questions and answer sessions and if you have any question please type uh, at the comments please drop your questions at the comment sections uh, and then prof rao just now uh, present a lot uh, about the honey bees It's a very interesting, and then about the VCO virgin coconut oil. I think that, that one is very uh, very interesting. Okay, and I think uh, uh, there is no question just now from the audience. Maybe I have some question for you, uh, Prof. Okay. Yeah. My first, uh, thank uh, you, Dr. Azhar. But there is a question from uh, Ponfara Kalis Binti Kedri. Okay, What sorry. challenges might arise in the cultivation and utilization of yes. medicinal for sustainable healthcare systems? or healthcare solutions yeah thank you uh, thank you ponfara so that's a good question what challenges might arise in the cultivation and utilization of medicinal plants for sustainable healthcare solutions so when we cultivate before we cultivate any medicinal plants there is a authority in every country to take permission so if we take permission prior permissions to cultivate and there there will no not be any problems for the utilization of medicinal plants for healthcare solutions and to go for product development bioproduct development or biological uh, product development certainly there are again agencies where regulatory affairs comes into the picture so we have to uh, clearly make the things available for them to uh, audit so with those kind of things uh certainly anyone you know with you know with with better knowledge can set up this particular thing uh, you know what you have asked in your question you can cultivate and also you can utilize this medicinal plants for sustainable healthcare so solution and i am very sure that this will be sustainable healthcare solution only mm. okay good thanks prof uh, professor rao uh, i think uh, maybe some question from me professor please This question is because you have been in malaysia before right Can yeah. you uh, share with us maybe the the differences between the Malaysian practices and in Indian practices regarding the medicinal plant, and then uh, what are the acceptance of the community or the people in Malaysia and in India? Is there is there any difference or is the same? Yeah, that's a good question. Even in one of my slides, I have mentioned that even Malaysia also practices various kinds of uh, traditional medicine. 
and uh, even the acceptance in Malaysia and India is almost same. But here, the based on the availability of uh, Yunani, is it the Ayurvedic? So the people are more uh, prone to use that because uh, homeopathy also, because the, the availability of this system is more here. Whereas mm. in Malaysia also, if you if you visit uh, you know places like uh, uh, Klantan or even Sabah or mm. some other rural areas where they have this uh, traditional medicine in a very strong manner. It's rooted very strongly. Okay. They use lots of extractions and they, their food system is different. So mm. acceptance is certainly there in both the countries and both the regions. But based on the availability, uh, you know, the acceptance level uh, differs a bit, you know, here and there. Oh, okay. Thank you, Professor. Maybe we have one question from the our Facebook uh, okay. from Mr. Nur Hizami. Uh, Okay. His question is, uh, Professor, about the stingless bee, there is high demand currently from human consumption. Is it true that the nutrition in stingless bee honey are higher than those in honey bee? Why is that? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, the participant, for the wonderful question. Yes, if you observe uh, one of my slides about the physical chemical properties of honey, mm -hmm which we have mentioned, there is a slight fluctuation when compared to the uh, string bee honeys. So thereby the potential or significance of biological activities of stingless bee honey is uh, slightly better than string bee honey. That is what uh, the uh, report clearly says based on the uh, nutritional composition or based on the regional composition. Because again, we have to remember here the honey composition is always depends on the uh, regional or region where we collect them. Because there are lots of parameters or lots, lots of factors involving in uh, honey, including the floral, floral resources, whether monofloral or multifloral, or the particular floral uh, uh, inflorescence or floral uh, uh, availability is you know, related to particular region only. So all these things, you know, make uh, stingless bee honey different, and also certainly, as your question is right, so it has got uh, better benefits than uh, the honey. However, in the majority, in a nutshell, um, uh, stingless bee honey and normal honey, they 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 have they possess very significant biological activities. Mm. Okay, thank you, Professor Rao, for the uh, answer. Uh, maybe uh, one question from me uh, regarding because you mentioned about because the Sezami, Mr. Hizami mentioned regarding the high demand. My question mm -hmm. is regarding the high demand on the medicinal plant. How are we going to maintain uh, the demand from the community about the commercial commercials herbal medicines? Is it any strategy to, to maintain the demand on the productions of the herbal medicines, or the herbal plants? From yeah, that's that's a really good question, uh, Dr. Azhar. Uh, well, the strategies the strategies can be maintained in different ways. The first thing is we have to create awareness to the public because the one thing which is lacking about uh, medicinal plants or herbal medicine is about awareness. We need to have lots of uh, you know uh, public awareness programs or campaigns to give understanding about herbal medicine and to also compare them with uh, allopathic medicines. What is the difference? And then what is the permanent solution? Because as I have mentioned earlier as well, uh, herbal medicine treatment is always a permanent solution. If you know it has been identified at the right time and the right dose has been given, either it can be single, uh, you know, single dose or you know, uh, single formulation or uh, polyherbal formulation. So they will identify the herbal medicines or urani, siddha, ayurvedic or the core researchers from herbal medicine background. They, they mm -hmm. try to, you know, uh, give polyherbal, you know, formulations according to the needs and requirements. But the mm -hmm. main thing is they have to identify the disease in a very right manner. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Professor Rao. I think there is no questions from the audience. Uh, I think... Uh, Thank you for all those who participate in the Q&A sessions. 
and for your thoughtful uh, questions. Unfortunately, uh, we have reached to the end of our time. Sorry, Prof. Rao. We have very limited time. Okay. Yes. Thank you for your time, uh, Prof. Rao. I want to express my gratitude uh, to our keynote speaker, Prof. Rao, for sharing his insight and expertise with us today. A big thank you to the organizing committee and to all participants uh, to making this conference a success. Uh, we have more exciting sessions and events and up throughout the day. So be sure to check the schedule at our web website. Once again, thank you all for being here today. Let's make the most of this conference and continue to learn, share ideas and build valuable connections and have a fantastic day ahead. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Mr. and the whole management of uh, UMK, Citrus committee members, and also Dr. Jairaj for inviting me for this conference. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Prof. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad Azhar Abbas for moderating the keynote sessions. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of Citrus 5.0 opening ceremony. Once again, I would like to express our thanks and gratitude to the Honorable Professor Dr. Dr. Ratli Benchik Razda, Vice Chancellor, University of Malaysia, Kelantan, for officiating the virtual opening ceremony of Citrus 5.0. The Honorable Dr. Abu Khadi Abu Hashim and Professor Technology, Dr. Paspoletti, with West Water Rao, Citrus 5.0 keynote speakers committee members, and to everyone who has contributed and involved in one way or another to the success of this conference. Our most precious thank you also goes to all the invited speakers and participants who attended this virtual symposium to share their experiences and engage with each other. The virtual presence is highly appreciated. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, all participants and members of the board, are now invited for a photo session. Time is switched on your camera for a virtual photo session. Okay, 
Okay, everyone. Uh, I count out three, everyone, two, one. Once again, okay, three, two, one. Thank you. 